evening, folks. It's good to be with you. And our last week with our Faith Foundations. And uh, we've obviously covered the first three. Uh, we'll go, go there in a moment. But I actually want to cover one of the scriptures that we've been using um, from Hebrews chapter 5, which gives the background or the, yeah, the context of why Paul was, Paul or the writer of the Hebrews, was saying we need to leave these foundations behind. Actually, they are foundations which always remain there, but the idea is that we don't need to keep on going back to them and learning them again because they should be established in our lives. And so that's the difference between milk and meat. The foundations that we're talking about are the milk. We need to get them operational or understand them in our lives so that we can go on to the meat of the word. And so this, this is what um, Hebrews uh, chapter 5 from verse 11 to the end of that chapter speaks about. Um, verse 12 says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. And anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So that's what we're talking about here. The milk has these, fi these six foundations and to have them established in your life. And because we want to not be the, ho the house that's sitting on the sand, because when the storm comes, it just may fall down. But the house to be established on the rock. So when the storms come, they will come, uh, we will come through those storms uh, stronger and better. But there may be some shaking that's gone on and so on. So getting these milk things established in our lives means we are going to be on a better foundation. Our house that God has built, we are a spiritual house, that house which is God is building in us, both as individuals, but being bricks or stones added into the bigger house, the church, if you might like to call it that, um, we become a strong house in God. So that's kind of where we've been, and I'm going to cover very quickly the three foundations that we've gone through. Um, actually, if I read that scripture, I'll, I'll tell you what they are. But what can you remember the first one? By the way, if you get the order wrong, it doesn't matter. So give it a go. Can you think of a foundation? One of the okay, Ethan. Can you think of one of the foundations that we've covered already? It's all gone. It's all gone. My my head is like a. A calendar <laughs> it's full of holes <laughs> all right so the first one is uh, uh, repentance from dead works all right and the second one is kind of related to it they're all part of it and faith towards God so uh, I'll read the scripture in a moment um, repentance from dead works is the things that we've been doing which are wrong sinful and so on we begin to realize that God does not like them they're bad so uh, we've been going along in a certain direction and um, we begin to realize both in our mind and our heart that that is wrong. We turn around as an action with our feet. Not only do we turn away from those things, but we turn towards God. So we have faith towards God, which is our second one. Um, so it's com they are combined, separate in entities in themselves. So we can understand them. We separate them out, but we actually need to put them together. That whole, and it's a lifestyle. It is a beginning. We start like that with Christ. When we come to know him, we turn from the old to the new. We become a new creation. But there is a lifetime of repenting from stuff that come up day by day. Some of us aren't sinners like that just once a month, I know. But whenever it comes up, things that are not right, God convicts us by the Holy Spirit. We've, we realize we've done wrong. We are quick to repent, to turn from that, both in our mind and our heart and have faith towards God and move on with him. Last week we covered baptisms and uh, I can read this scripture now at chapter 6. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God or faith towards God. Instruction about baptisms. And last week we covered both water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. And um, 
if you want an action point on that, if you haven't been baptized in water, do it. <laughs> um, if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit or you haven't had that freedom uh, in, in the Holy Spirit where you begin to speak in tongues and that fullness of the baptism comes through, find somebody. We can perhaps even pray for you tonight. We're actually going to activate a little bit later on um, and ask for somebody to pray with you to, or just in your own w little world, whatever that might look like, ask the Lord for the fullness of that baptism of the Holy Spirit. So today we've got three more, which we'll whiz through them fairly quickly. The first one we're going to spend a bit more time on. That is the laying on of hands. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You might ask, why are these three in there? Well, number four kind of, I get that. But five and six are important. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them, but they're important to understand. And they form a foundation. If we understand what that means, and, and that's established in our lives, and we say, look, I believe in that. I can see that eternal judgment, is there's judgment coming. Um, for example, knowing that there's going to be eternal judgment can be a very good deterrent from sinfulness, can't it? Well, in my life, anyway. <laughs> so there are some very, uh, very, very key aspects that are laid into these f f uh, three. So let's go on to laying on of hands. So um, what does the Bible say about this? Why is it in here? Uh, by the way, it's fairly uh, common right throughout the Old Testament and the New um, but there's some questions. Why? What? Where? And when? Is this phenomena? We've probably seen it acted out if you've been in church, for example, or been a prayer meeting or a, a, li a life hub or a home group or something like that. Um, and it's done and we kind of get into it and begin to understand it. But what is behind it? Why do, is this so important? And so we want to unpack this now in the next, say, 30 odd minutes. So the laying on of hands was an action referred to on numerous occasions in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll get into the New Testament in a moment. But just want to show you that it's, it's right through the Old Testament and it kind of doesn't change much or is added to a little bit in the New Testament. So it was an action. So you notice I've colored those words. was an action referred to on numerous occasions in the Old Testament to accompany the conferring of a blessing or authority. Moses ordained Joshua by the laying on of hands. Um, probably won't hurt to look at one of those. Maybe we'll go to Deuteronomy. It won't matter which of those. Um, mind you, numbers has opened up. So it's going to be numbers. <laughs> but I'm one-handed here. So uh, 20, um, Numbers 27 and verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly, and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority, so that the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest, who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the, of, of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command they will come in. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord instructed through Moses. So there's quite a bit in there. There's quite a bit of understanding of the principle or the why of laying on of hands. Um, so we'll unpack that in a, in a moment. So Joshua was therefore filled with the spirit of wisdom. That is imparted wisdom. It's wisdom that he didn't necessarily have. He may have had a, a degree of wisdom. He was like discipled by Moses for many years. Moses was about to die. He was going to move on. And so God said, take Joshua who's been your assistant for so long. Uh, and we see that happening um, is it in Joshua itself. And so we see that happening a little later on, what happens there. So he prayed over him, laid hands on him, and certain aspects of what Moses carried was imparted or released 
into Joshua's life. So, um, as we'll see in the New Testament, when we lay hands on somebody who's been appointed for something, um, or into a new ministry or something, it's very common for us to lay hands on them and impart that. So we'll unpack that in a moment as we go along. So, let's just see here some p pertinent points that come out of this. One, it's a Bible principle, so we see it, sh this is not just here, but in several places, and into the New Testament. We'll unpack some of those soon. So there's a biblical principle of laying on of hands. It's there. It's right through. It's probably one of the most common things in many ways. It's an action. See wh wh how I said the laying on of hands was an action referred to. So it's something we do. So it's something that we do intentionally. It's not something we do because it, we just do it. Oh, let's just lay hands on. So we have to be careful with it because if we lay hands on somebody who's not ready or is the wrong person, we can impart something to them uh, in a wrong way. By the way, the enemy can do the same thing. If a person is full of devils and they lay hands on somebody, they can actually release some of those demonic presences into that person. So it's a principle that we have uh, it's supposed to be for the positive, but the enemy can use it as well. But we're looking at the positive side of it. Yes, amen. Not the negative. So it's an action. It's an intentionality that we do as, as part of our, our ministry and work that we do within the local ecclesia, the local church. It's a blessing, or it can, it, it, it con can confer a blessing. It says here, a conferring of a blessing or authority is in the case of Joshua, but um, Jesus did this with the little children. He said, you know, th we can look at Mark chapter 10 if you want to, but we just, I think I'll just leave it. But what happened is that um, the little children came to him, Jesus was um, holding them and so on, and the disciples were trying to stop people from coming and bringing these little kids, these little snotty-nosed things, you know, um, just take them away. But Jesus saw that, and he got, it was very indignant. He said, no, let these come to me, you know. Um, for, and so he began to then just put his hand on them and he blessed them. And it, I, I was just thinking about this today. I wonder what he said over them. What did he say over those little children? So obviously children are very um, open to the things of the Spirit. The older you get, and if you've been in sin in particular, you become, become closed off to things of God. But when little children... Are, interact with or the reality of God's spirit or God's presence or Jesus himself, they are very open, very susceptible, and so Jesus just wanted to bless them. And I wouldn't be surprised if each of those children somehow came back to know Jesus later on in life. So it's a way of imparting blessing is through the laying on of hands. By the way, if you've got any questions anywhere, just <coughs> pop your hand up and ask. So authority conferred, as we saw here in this situation, then that's where we get these words from, or religious words sometimes, ordination or being ordained or commissioned. I think it actually used that word here at the end of um, Numbers 27. It says, then he laid hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord had instructed Moses. So there's a, um, a commissioning when we put people into places of authority and function. It's part of that as we lay hands on them. Acts chapter 6, uh, I don't know if you know this story, it's when um, the numbers of disciples were growing. There were so many groups of people, and some of them from different cultures now, and they uh, at times um, gave out food to certain groups, and some of them were being missed out. And so there was a big noise about it, so that it, the um, apostles met together about this thing. And they decide we need to find seven people on who the Spirit of God is on and, and who have wisdom so that they can oversee this. So they selected those seven, brought them forward, laid hands on them and prayed over them and released them into that ministry. So it's very common for us to do that um, as people are recognized and called forth into certain aspects of either leadership or ministry or whatever it is. All good? Yes. Am I going too fast? Um, anointing, sometimes with oil. By the way, this James 5 scripture um, doesn't actually say laying hands, 
But it says, if anybody is sick, let call the elders and anoint him, and the prayer of faith will save that person, and they will be healed. So uh, there are other times in the scriptures, and I, I just, actually it was just before we started tonight, I looked at the scripture and I thought, oops, it actually doesn't say laying hands. And I didn't have enough time to find another scripture um, associating anointing with oil and laying on of hands. So um, anyway, but it's obviously associated with that. So I just wanted to pop that one in there. Healing. Um, we'll go to this one, Mark chapter 5 and verse 23. Um, the same um, incident was recorded in Matthew, but we'll go to the Mark recording of this. Beginning in verse 23. Um, actually, verse, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over the, by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers, named Jairus, came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hand, hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him, and, th and that's what he did. Um, then, of course, there was a woman with, with, with a bleeding issue. She touched Jesus, by the way, this is the other way around, not the laying on of hands, but there is impartation because she touched him. Um, and then eventually Jesus got to uh, the house. In verse um, 34, he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So what he had done, he just took hold of her hand and, um, uh, and then spoke to her. So But Jairus said, please put your hands on her. So he knew that principle as a, as a synagogue ruler, that it was a way of imparting, in this case, healing. So when we pray for people that are sick, we can lay hands on them. Now that relates back to the previous one where we can anoint with oil as well. So hence, they do go together. The gifting or enabling. Um, and... Paul, um, yeah, let's go to Acts chapter 19. This was uh, when the Ephesians were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, he found some believers and um, when he visited Ephesus for the first time. And um, so he asked them uh, what was their experience, what was the, what baptism. They said, well, we know John's baptism. And so he talked to them about um, the baptism, that water baptism. Where we go here? Um, he said to them in, in Acts chapter 19, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This is in um, verse 1, 2. Um, they answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, he said. They said, Oh, Paul said, verse 4. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance and he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Hallelujah. So, uh, one of the ways of releasing the Holy Spirit is through the laying on of hands, praying over people, releasing God's Holy Spirit into their lives and seeing them come into a fuller uh, walk with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And uh, Second Timothy, the other scripture there, is, um, is, is speaking about Timothy himself. Why don't we go to that? Second Timothy, how he was a young man. Um, he uh, struggled a little bit uh, as he was uh, visiting the churches, as he would have in that culture. But... Paul encouraged him and he wrote to him in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. He said, um, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So obviously at that point when Timothy was appointed or released to go on a visit or whatever it was, there was a prophecy over him. And um, it's, it says that elsewhere, in, I think in 1 Timothy. And... And also Paul laid his hands on him and released the gifts 
um, that he needed for which he was um, to minister with. So, so therefore we see giftings or enablings um, come about through the laying on of hands. All right. Um, this laying on of hands is not that one when we're angry, he says, let, my hand, let me lay my hands on that guy. That's a different <laughs> laying on of hands. <laughs> Amen. This is the blessing. This is the impartation. This is uh, giving authority or ministry. This is anointing that person and sometimes laying hands on them for healing, for example, gifts, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and so on. So any questions so far? All right. So we're going to take a, a short break, but before, as we take the break, in fact, the break is going to be a little bit of impartation or what's the word that you use, Jesus? Jess? Uh, activation, right. So I think we should um, put this into practice as much as we can. So we're going to do that right now. So I'm going to look for anybody who would like to be prayed for in any particular way. Uh, we'll have to figure out what we do with that, of course, especially if you're sick, not well, um, haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit and want to come into tongues. Um, we were t chatting to you a little bit before about your daughter's situation. Why don't we pray for you? So, um, I want us to receive a blessing, eh? Or to receive a blessing. Just, sorry again? Yeah. I find um, my own experience in this is that I carry a level of peace in my life. So if I come into a situation where people are um, upset, uh, in uh, fear or anything like that, the anxiety, for example, I can normally just I can w walk them through a little bit. I say, I'm going to pray for you, and I can release peace upon them, and generally people will come into a greater level of peace, sometimes huge amounts, sometimes just a small change, but it depends on their situation. Um, the other area is just praying for the sick. I, I love praying for sick, and I prayed for Jess yesterday. She had a migraine, and she was visiting our place in the afternoon, so as she left, um, I just prayed over for about a minute maximum, just anything that came into my mind, I just prayed and so on, and as she went away, she said you felt better. It was. Okay, so there you go. Migraines. We've got them. Sorted. <laughs> Okay. I'm not for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But again, once you um, become more conversant with this and you're with others that you can trust and so on, you can get them to pray with you. Uh, it's a little bit difficult sometimes praying through these things by yourself. So that's why we do need the, the larger body to uh, help us to stand with us. One can chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand. So there's that incremental increase as we come together and, and so on. So. Who's in for this? I'm going to drop the microphone just for now and um, we'll come back on in just a moment. All right, let's continue on then. Thanks so much for just praying for one another and uh, don't know if I should have put it all through here, but I think it was private, so it's probably the best way to do it. So, there's the, the major... Um, foundation of our faith really is, is the laying on of hands, very important. So uh, whether you receive that or um, uh, pray for others and so on, um, just exercise your faith for yourself and for others and, and, and you'll see uh, yourself, God will start to use you. Some of the gifts of the Spirit will start to function and so on as you step out in faith into that um, unknown area maybe for you. So well done, thank you very much. We're just going to go quickly on to the last two of our foundations, the resurrection of the dead. In Acts 24, 15, there shall, there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So it's very interesting to note, we tend to think that resurrection is just for us guys who know the Lord Jesus, having died and gone to heaven. Uh, res resurrection speaks of the coming together again of your spirit and soul back into your body. And of course, there's all sorts of questions. You mean to say this, which has been eaten by a shark or whatever, or burnt, if cremated? How can that happen? Well, 
Yeah, good question. I don't have the answers for that, but God can, and he does. So there's the, uh, the coming together again uh, from, for ourselves who, who know the Lord, obviously, um, from heaven, and uh, we are reunited with our bodies and resurrected into the resurrection body, which is the same body as Jesus has, uh, where the laws of nature no longer have a uh, hold on that. He was able to walk through a door, he was able to move, go from place to place, and so on like that. And so there shall be the resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So also the other foundation that we've got up coming up will feature a little bit of, okay, what about the unjust? They've gone to supposedly to hell or Hades. How do they come back into their bodies? Well, they actually have to be judged in their bodies for the deeds done in the body. So hence the reason why there will be even a resurrection for them, but under different conditions. But let's look at the rest of this first. So the resurrection amounts to the Father's clear signal that Jesus is the powerful Son of God who has conquered death, yes, and reigns as Lord of all. Um, we can see that in Romans. Do we have enough time? Yeah, we'll have a quick look. In uh, Romans chapter 1, where Paul refers to it as part of his introduction as he starts to write the letter to the Romans. Um, so he mentions it there and again in chapter 4. Verse 4, um, well verse 3 says, Regarding his son, who as a human, or as to his human nature was a descendant of David, who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the resur resurrection of the dead proves a whole lot of things. Um, it demonstrates, for example, the resurrection demonstrates that Jesus' blood of the new covenant saves his people from their sins. I, it's, it's a physical aspect that happens, it's a spiritual thing that happens, it's a miracle. If, God, if Jesus can be resurrected and we can be resurrected, then the other issues that are around us, like sin and so on, is, is much easier to see or believe in that sense. So it proves how powerful God is. Um, resurrection, Jesus resurrection himself proves that. And so, um, yeah, it's exciting when I think of, I'm not going to have this old body in the next life. I might look the same. I think we all you know, look, we can recognize each other and all that sort of thing. But it's not going to be subject to decay anymore, to, to sickness, to weaknesses, um, and so on, as we find in this life. So the resurrection of the dead is something very definitely it's ahead of us. It's something we can look forward to. It's powerful. Uh, if I have to give my life up, in the sense of, in, in a persecution situation, I was talking to some people in Burkina Faso this morning, and there are people being martyred there at the moment, just with a, um, a resurrection, uh, sorry, an insurrection, sorry, wrong word, um, happening in the northeast of the country. Uh, Christians are being butchered. Um, if I was in that situation, because I don't want to be, but if I was, and I thought, there's no way out of this, here goes my life, I am going to be resurrected from the dead anyway. In fact, now I'm going to be in, in glory with God, any, with Jesus anyway, but I am going to come back into this body and be resurrected one day. So in a sense, it's a little bit easier to let go of this life, knowing that we have a future life with Jesus now in heaven, being with the Lord. As Paul said, if to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which he preferred, but he had to stay on for a little bit longer. So, Resurrection of the dead. Are you looking forward to the resurrection of the dead? Do you think about it sometimes? Have you ever thought about it? So there you are. So wha that's why we cover this, because it's very essential for us to understand, no, there is going to be a resurrection, and because I have Christ in me, I'm going to be resurrected with the righteous. So there's a second resurrection. Let's just go over to the, uh, the next one, the eternal judgment, because it's also related to that. So, Hebrews 9.27, as far as eternal judgment is concerned, says that people are just destined, all people are destined to die once, and after that to face the judgment. 
as I said, in their bodies. So there has to be a resurrection. Um, and Revelation 20 speaks of this, verses 12 to 14. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. So that's something else you might not realize. There's a book. All of your actions, uh, since you were born, are recorded in a book. And when you come to Christ, the bad things have been wiped out and you start it again. So then as a Christian, then all your deeds are recorded in a book. And so, um, but also the non-Christians, those who've rejected God, also have things recorded in a book. And so that book's brought out and we're judged according to what is written in there. So the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades, that's hell, gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second death. So you and I are only going through one death. That's the one coming. I don't know when it is, but, you know, in this life, when this physical body dies, um, we're going to suffer that death, obviously. Our spirit comes up out of our body. Our soul goes immediately to be with the Lord. The angels take us into heaven and we live with the Lord until we come back and for the resurrection when our, we are reunited with our bodies and then we are judged. Now our judgment as Christians actually is more in the sense of uh, not so much of the second death because we've passed that judgment. We don't have to worry about that because you have our faith in Christ. Our, we've repented. We've turned away from our sins. We have faith towards God. The, 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 the past that was not right has been wiped out and no longer remembered. And even as you go along through life, if you do something wrong, as you come to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for that, that attitude, that action, whatever it is, that's wiped out of the book and it can't be seen anymore. We see it. I mean, we remember it, but the Lord doesn't. You know, if we keep on coming to the Lord and say, oh, Lord, I made a mess five years ago, and you say it every day, so the Lord eventually is going to say, I don't know what you're talking about because it's been wiped out of the book. He has no memory of it, and so on. So there is going to be a, a second death for those who have rejected Christ when they are cast into the lake of fire, and they live in that constant state of death forever and ever, which is not nice, which motivates us to share the gospel, doesn't it? Because I don't want to think of one person is going to be in the lake of fire forever and ever, suffering horribleness. Why we are having the joy of the resurrection life. We, we, we suffer in beautiful peace or paradise. It's not suffer, I'm saying, you know what I mean? But we, we get to enjoy that. And the absence of e every sense of evil um, that we c experience now on earth. Eternal judgment. <laughs> Yeah, did you, have you ever thought much about it? That there is such a thing? Okay, so the second one in a row, isn't it? So the resurrection, um, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment are both essential for us to get an understanding of. Um, as I said, I think there's a sense of, a little, in my own life anyway, I think there's a sense of motivation to live a good life because these things are ahead of us and there's no reason why I won't be in heaven but hey what about um, even my actions as a Christian I want to keep the, my slate clean or I want to keep my record clean um, because I don't want the Lord to judge me according to for the things that I've done in this life um, there's, uh, I think it's in Corinthians where it says that we will be um, rewarded. Th and th this I should have actually looked up the scripture and I've forgotten it. But it s speaks about, um, there are things of, of wood and hay and stubble. Those things will be burnt up. That's the things that we've done which are of no value to the Lord. But there are things that will actually withstand that judgment, uh, that sec second judgment in a sense. And they will come through clear and clean. So that's us. Amen? All right. So is there any questions at this point? <laughs> is there any questions, though, in regard to any of these foundations 
at the moment. You're all clear. You've got all six established in your life. Yep, all good. I would just f as we finish off though, I'd like um, perhaps just to share some highlight from this series that has been positive for you, has been good for you, or something that you've learnt that um, that you had never considered before, or any other thing that you've sort kind of. I'm so I would like each of you just to give a very brief summary of what you've seen or understood. Um, or even if it's a question that, I actually because of this, now that's opened up a whole area that I haven't really thought about. So, um, but that's been a positive as well, hopefully. So anybody, who's first? I know the three of you have only been one night, and but you had did look at the other videos. <laughs> so so any, just, just think it through. What's one thing that's been a highlight? That might be from the whole three nights, it, or it could have been just one aspect. You may have shared it. Uh, we, we had a chance, especially in the first week, to share some of these things. So, right, who's first? You'll start, Ethan. Um, about all of like speaking in tongues and being like baptized of the Spirit. Like, I've always like known about it, but I kind of like closed off that part because I was like, oh, I, I don't speak in tongues. That's not for me. But like, yeah, being opened up to seeing that is like a gift for everyone. It's just opening your heart to it, I guess. So, in, like going forward, ha, uh, do you speak in tongues at the moment? Okay. So, so going forward now, you've got. S are you? Uh, I mean, let me. Put, I don't want to put words into your mouth. How? When you go f looking forward, ha how are you approaching this now? In a oh sense. I'll say it. I'll say it like great. It. That's good. Okay, repentance for me was the biggest one. That's that one sticking with me. And the action, so um, actually walking it out. You know, you can say sorry to someone and like, oh, I repent for it. But truly in your heart, repenting for something and choosing a life where you're turning around and walking in faith and genuine, genuinely not people-pleasing or just, you know, um, for me, yeah, I struggled with... Um, performance orientation a lot so it was like comply just do what people say and I'm sorry and genuinely be sorry but not actually feel like I want to repent and not do it again does that make sense yeah um yeah so and faith having faith that I the repentance is real and you can actually walk a better life did you want to do you want to say something come on All right. I think for me, because I haven't covered these for a long time, I mean, it says to move away from these, to move on the, the milk aspect, you know. These are, these are milk, but really, um, I have taught this several times over the years, but not for a long time. And uh, I didn't have, I've got none of those original notes. I've just gone and made new notes. But just to go through these things, they're so important and to refresh yourself in them. So even though it says to move away and I think perhaps we'll uh, um, go back to Hebrews and just read that as we finish but um, to move away from these things we we in a sense don't move away from them but we do I'll try and exp do, you, do you know what I'm saying we we they are our foundation so they're always going to be with us but they're established in our lives now to the point that we don't we've we've gone through them uh, we, we may in fact be built up more and more in each of these, but um, we kind of leave them behind, but they go with us. So th therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. So the, the, what we are wanting to see in all of your lives is that there's a, a, an area of maturity in your Christian faith. There's a sense of assurance. There's aspects like, for example, what you just said now, well, I understand repentance a whole lot more, and then you apply it on a daily basis. You, you know, you, your hunger for uh, the filling of the, uh, the Holy Spirit and, and coming into speaking of tongues, I can identify with that because it took a little while for myself to come into that. So go for it. Um, just trust the Lord in these areas, and um, I think it's good to inspect the foundations to make sure they're all in place. 
Amen. Well done. Shall we pray as we finish? Father, I just thank you uh, for these beautiful foundations. I, I'm just aware of the temple that's that in heaven that has these foundation stones or, or, or pearls or um, yeah, different sto stones like sapphire and ruby and so on. And that's all important, Lord, uh, for you to have a foundation that's built properly. It's something that uh, you are the chief cornerstone yourself. That's what we measure everything from. And so foundations are totally important to you. Without the foundation being built properly, the house will not stand. And also what the foundation goes on to is so, so important. Onto Jesus the rock, as opposed to sandy uh, ways in life. So Father, we thank you. We pray for your blessings. I pray for your blessings that each person going through this course and their, and their walk with you and their discipleship journey, uh, whether it's uh, directly with you and just through hearing messages like this or relating to others and being discipled by others. I just pray your blessing upon each one, Lord Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Amen and amen. And thanks, Noah, for helping us. Bless you. Really appreciate it. Amen. Did you learn something, Noah? You're not sure? I'm sure there's lots of things you just don't want to say. <laughs> Amen. God bless you all, and thank you for so much.